I'll try and uh, use this from over here. We'll see how we go. I'll just down here. Yeah. All right. So number one was what? What was number one? Establish your own private home. Establish your own private home. And we discussed about the family on that and the reasons for that. And then number two was? Continue your courtship. Continue the courtship, meaning the relationship, deepen that relationship. Just because you get married, it doesn't mean you just stop loving one another. No, that's the end of it. No, it's the beginning of a walk together. So just like God inspires his word and then preserves his word, you need to establish your home and then continue with it, right? Just like inspiration and preservation are two major legs. We also discovered that the marriage itself is really the first church, right? It's the first church in which God has blessed these two people, and they were to multiply. Isn't that what God said at the beginning? Remember what God said at the beginning? Yeah. You need to multiply, fill the earth. Well, how are they going to do that? It was through the family that more children of God would come and be part of the kingdom of heaven. And now, because of man's sin, man fell, children are born of the flesh. They need to be born of the Holy Spirit, right? So this is how we continue the family in a greater sense, through baptism like we had today for our brother and our sister today. Great service. And we're going to continue on past that. We'll move past that. Not dwell on it too much. All right. Number three, it says what? Remember that God joined you together in marriage. Yeah, you have to remember that God joined you together in marriage. It wasn't just your two ideas. Hopefully, what should have happened was prayer, there should have been counseling, there should have been family getting together, is this marriage right, what's the background? Um, all these things should have taken place. But above all that, it was God himself who brings the man and the woman together. It's God who unites two into one. So the Bible says, well, God had joined together, let no man put asunder or separate or divide. And there's a lot of people taking that prerogative through divorce and through wrongful separation, a lot of things today. So you have to remember. What does the word remember mean? To rethink, to do again. Well, what is a member? A part. A member is a, a part. It's a piece of something, like a body part or a car part or, or something. It's a member, right? But to remember is to bring back the members together, right? So for remembering, you're bringing one part of your brain back to another part, and you're making them connect again, right? Oh, I have that idea. So to remember is to remember and bring back that it was God who initiated, it was God who blessed it, it was God who was uniting this thing together. And therefore, as long as you keep that mind or that in mind, you're both focused on the same thing. The man and the woman are focused together on God. They're not focusing on themselves. They're focusing on God who united them. It, it keeps away from a lot of the uh, nitpicking that takes place. right? So it says, let's take a look at Matthew 19, verses 5 and 6. I'm going to use the King James because this lesson uses the New King James, but I don't trust the New King James. And if you don't believe me, well, you come to study with me and you'll find out why. Matthew 19, 5 and 6. I should go grab my Bible over here. When you guys get there, you let me know, please. Bible. Amen. Where? Over there. Matthew 19, 5 and 6. 5 and 6. Are you guys there? Yeah. All right. We're going to go. All right. It says, Matthew 19, 5. And it says, And said, Jesus is speaking, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain two shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more what? Twain. No more twain. They are no more two, right? But one. but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder, or separate, or divide. Break apart, right? In divorces, what happens? It's not just the man and the wife break apart, whole families break apart. It crumbles to ashes, bones, arguments, fights, children, right? It becomes a very um, messy scene. Because it's one of the closest relationships that mankind has, besides the relationship to God, is in the marriage and the family. And once that's ruined, 
and it ruins children's lives, the husband's life, the, the wife's life, right? And your relatives, they pick sides. And then it affects society around you, your neighbors, uh, even your church, uh, your business, just your school, anything. It, it doesn't just stay there. It leaks out all over the place. It's like if you had a balloon filled with water and it breaks. What happens to the water? It spills all over the place. It doesn't spill in a uniform area. It goes over here, a little bit over here, it gets on you. That's what happens when a marriage comes in divorce. Now, there is rightful divorce and wrongful divorce, but we're talking about the wrongful divorce, where it's just totally shattering to the family. But even a rightful divorce can do the same thing, too. All right. So it says, has love almost disappeared from your home? And the real question for that is, because remember, so remember that God have joined you together in marriage. So if it says that love almost disappeared from your home, but what does the Bible say? Who is love? Yeah. Right? Take a look. At 1 John, chapter 4. 1 John, chapter 4. Verses 8. And also 16. We're going to look at 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 and 16. And it says this, He that loveth not, or doesn't love, knoweth, that is by experience, not what? God. They don't know God. For, meaning because, God is love. love. Alright, now take a look at verse 16. It says, And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. So when it says, has love almost disappeared from your home, who is the one that's really disappearing? God. God. Even Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit, right? If God's not the center of the home, then it cannot possibly be bound together. It will not hold. He's the center. He's the foundation. He's the, the glue, as it were, that binds everything together. He would be like, um, and take this with a grain of salt, like the molecular energy that binds the molecules together. Without that, what's binding the molecules together? Nothing. And no, I'm not saying God is, a, is, a, is an energy. I'm just using that as an example. So, has love almost disappeared from your home? Sometimes you got to take a moment and think, where is Christ in my home? Is he at the center? Is he at the dinner table? Is he out in the yard working with me? Where is Christ in my home? Do I have a place for him in my home? I should, because he's the one that bound me to my spouse, husband or wife. He's the one that united us together, and he has the centermost place, not only in my individual life, but also in our life together, husband, wife, and then parents to children. Where is God? Where is he? In the home. If you don't know, you better start looking for him because it might begin to say where he's disappearing. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, don't you notice when something in your house is there and all of a sudden it's, it starts disappearing? Like food? Like, who's eating all my food? Right? If you bring it in, it's there for a while, but all of a sudden you notice the shelf starting to get emptier and emptier and it's leaving, it's slowly leaving. You could say, like the water that we buy at the store, right? You got a bottle of water, it slowly starts to. But you know where it is in the house. So where is God? Where is Christ in your home? It says the devil, that notorious what? Home breaker. Home breaker. A home breaker. What did the devil do in heaven? He brought division. Take a look at this. Take a look at Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, and take a look at verse 3. Let's start with verse 3. Revelation 12, verse 3. Mm -hmm. It says, And there appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his head. Now that's also dealing with Rome, but we're looking past Rome to the devil himself. Verse 4 says, And his tail drew what? The third. The third part of the stars of heaven. It says, and did cast him to the earth, and then the woman, uh, the dragon stood before the woman, which is ready to be delivered, for to devour a child as soon as it was born. Talking about the birth of Jesus. But we're talking about the division in heaven, right? And also take a look at 
Verse 7. Take a look at verse 7. A little bit more of that. And there was what in heaven? War. War. What's a war? It's a conflict. It's a fight. It's a division. Right? One side and another side. Right? There is war in heaven, says Michael, which is just another name for Jesus Christ. That's uh, the Son of God. And his angels, they like Gabriel and all those guys, fought against who? The dragon. The dragon. And another name for the dragon is the devil. You can find that in verse 9. And what else happened? And the dragon fought and his angels. Well, you find out that they did not prevail. So even in heaven itself, there was a division. There was division among family, right? People took sides. Sometimes you have to take sides between right and wrong. You may not want to, but because it's right or because it's wrong, you've got to pick a side. And you're going to be face-to-face -face with that. Sometimes it's in the marriage. Sometimes it's in the church. Sometimes it's in a relationship among your friends, right? Your friends may say, hey, let's go throw a rock through a window. You're going to have to stand up and say, no, that's wrong. There's going to be a division, a war there. It's a righteous war. But in this sense, the devil didn't have a righteous cause. He just caused division because of selfishness. So what causes division in the marriage? Selfishness. Same thing. Self rises up. I want that position. I want that thing. I, 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 me, 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 me. i got to get my way, whatever it is. So it says, the notorious homebreaker. He wrecked heaven. Not just for himself, but for how many others? Oh. Everybody else. Because think about how the family that was in heaven. They knew each other for ages and ages. We don't know how long that they were in creation. But they were there. Now, can you imagine losing your best friend that you knew for like a thousand years? Think about it. Imagine if you lose your friend that you knew for 20 years. How hard that would be. And they turn against you. And then you've got to pick a side. Now think about that, what it takes for a thousand years, or ten thousand years. How hard that is for the angels up there. Now how much more in our marriages also down here? Some of you know, some of you love. And that's why um, when some people get divorced, and they drag it through the public courts, and they drag your name through the streets, it becomes very, very bitter. Right? That's what happens. It's destructive. You're going to fight no matter what, and you'll try to tear that other person down no matter the cost, even though you had loved them for the 10, 20 years that you were married. Because self takes the precedence over that person. But in love, that person takes precedence over what? Over you, over yourself. And God first and foremost above all. So it says, he is responsible for this. You may think, oh, it was my wife. Oh, it was my husband. Oh, it was my children. No. The devil was the one who instigated it in the beginning. He started planting the seed of doubt, the seed of jealousy, the seed of whatever, covetousness, somewhere in the heart. It says, don't forget that God himself joined you together in marriage. And he intends for you to what? Stay together and be what? Be happy. And it's not even so much happiness. It's to be filled with all joy. Because he gave that person to you as a gift. You think about it. Right? I mean, you receive a brand new car, right, as a gift. Don't you jump for joy at that? Now, how much more for a person who can love you back? Your car can't love you back. I don't even care if it's kit from Knight Rider. That car can't love you back, right? Yeah. You know, that's the wrong Michael Knight, that's the, <laughs> right? So a car is not going to love you in return, but a person can, of their own free will. And they've chosen to spend that time and that life with you. So how much greater of a gift is that? God himself even approves. So he will bring happiness, even joy, and love into your lives if you will what? Obey. His divine rules. And that's not really just talking about the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are exceeding broad. But it's even to the rules within marriage. Because as with a gift, like let's say I give you a brand new car, doesn't it come with rules? Like don't put sugar in the gas tank? Right? Don't get in your car with full of mud and, and you know what I mean? Leave the engine open and exposed to the rain. So how much more of a marriage that it needs maintenance and proper care and the right fuel and right? Same with a real relationship. It's even more because they have a free will. It's more delicate than a car. We can injure people real quick by the things that we say, the things that we do, even a look, right? 
you, sometimes we don't mean that, but that's what we do when we go, you know, right? Like, let's say a little child rolls their eyes at their parents, right? They didn't say anything. We can tell what's going on in the heart when they just go, you know, right? But in a marriage, you can do the same thing to one another. And because you're closer together, it becomes down to the nitty gritties. Like, you, you read each other's signs more, right? Yeah. It says, with God, all things are possible. Take a look at Matthew 19, 26. Matthew 19? Yeah, Matthew 19. New Testament, Matthew. Chapter 19, verse 26. But also look at 25. We'll read the context. Look at verse 25. Jesus, Jesus was talking about 19, 10, 10, 10, 10, 25 and 26. Before that, he's talking about the rich man. How hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, right? Because they trust in their riches. Mm. Verse 25. When his disciples heard that, or heard it, they were exceedingly what? Amazed. Amazed. They wondered. They're like, wow, really? Saying, who then can be saved? Because the rabbis taught that if you're wealthy, you are blessed of God. It was the wealth that showed that you were saved, right? Because they were very covetous. But look at verse 26. But Jesus beheld them, he's looking at them, and said to them, With men, this is, talking about the salvation of the rich man, is impossible, but with God, what? All things. All things are possible. Absolutely. Notice the context is salvation. So can he save a marriage? Yes. What if the marriage just looks like it's about to wreck? It's on the rocks. It's very stormy, right? If you try the, the last straw, have you tried God? Sometimes we put God last in that equation instead of God first. We don't kneel to God immediately as soon as the argument starts or whatever happens. We go to God last. So we don't even start praying in our minds when we start to get an argument within a general relationship just between brothers and sisters, right, or neighbors. We leave God last. We try and solve it ourselves somehow. But remember that it's God that joins you together in marriage. And he's the one that joins you. He's the one that can bring you back together. Not yourselves. It wasn't self that put the marriage together. It was God. So in the context of Matthew 19, 26, God can bring the salvation. Right? It says, don't despair. God who places love in the heart of a, what? Missionary. Missionary for a leprous, a diseased savage, can easily give you what? Love. Because love is the gift. Right? You can't manufacture it. You can't work for it. It's a gift for each other if you will. Yeah. Remember the leper? Yeah. If thou will, you can make me clean. And Jesus says, I do will. I will make me clean. Because Jesus came into the world to heal every man. All their blindness and all their sickness. He didn't want anybody to remain deaf and anybody to remain blind, whether physical or spiritual, especially spiritual. So how much more the marriage? If you become blind to one another in marriage, you can no longer see that other person in love. That means you're blind. Right? You can no longer hear their entreaties of mercy, and you're cruel to them. It means you're deaf. You can no longer speak a kind word to them. That means you're dumb to the things of God. Right? Your mouth can't open into any other thing that's good. It's always negative, 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 negative. Right? But God can fix all that. He created me a clean heart, and He gave me a right spirit of that. And then that fixes the mouth. It opens the ears. Right? You remember what Jesus did to the man who was... Uh, Deaf and couldn't speak, he was dumb. He stuck his fingers in his ear. Right? Yeah, like this. He stuck his fingers in his ear. What's the symbol of the finger of Jesus? What is the finger of God in the Bible? Close. You guys remember the Ten Commandments? Yes. How did God write the Ten Commandments? It says with his finger. In another place in the New Testament, it says Jesus talking about casting out devils. I cast out devils with the finger of God. But in another gospel, it says, I cast out devils by the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Ghost. So the finger of God is just merely a saying for the Holy what? The Holy Ghost. When he puts his fingers in your ears, you need the what? The Holy Ghost to be able to hear what that other person is saying. You need the Holy Ghost to open your eyes. The Holy Ghost to give you the new heart. All right? You see, between the two people... Is really the spirit of love. If it's not the spirit of love, the Holy Ghost, it's another spirit. It's the spirit of contention. It's the spirit of covetousness. It's the spirit of jealousy, right? The spirit of control. And the spirit of control can really.
really grow in America. All right, so you have to lend it. You have to lend it. So one of the things you need to do is what? Number four. What does it mean? Guard your thoughts. Be careful what you let in. Yeah. And also what you think about. Because things can come in, but there's also things that arise from within. Like what Paul said in the book of Acts chapter 20. Like evil men arise from without, and evil men rise from within the church. But the same thing happens to our thoughts. Thoughts can come from outside, like from a television, a phone, a radio, a person. But also you got thoughts that arise from within based on your other thoughts. Right? So wickedness is not always external. The Bible says that the heart is deceitfully wicked already. So the wickedness can arise from within. So that means, guard your thoughts, it means keep watch over your thoughts. Because what does a guard do? Keep watch. He's keeping watch. He's watching for something. An enemy to come in, right? Or maybe an enemy that's already within. Right? So, take a look at X, or excuse me, Proverbs 23, 7. Take a look at Proverbs 23, 7. Proverbs 23, 7. Amen. Emmanuel. You guys there? Yes. Amen. There? Amen. Waiting for our sisters. All right. A little more. Proverbs 23, verse 7. Like I said, I like to read it from the Bible itself, not just the text on the screen, because there's more context that you can take a look at. All right. So it says this. For as he, the person, right? Think it where? In his heart. In his heart, which is here. This, this is your pump. This is the real heart, the mind, the spirit, right here. So what? Is he? So is he. Right? Is what you think about is what you are. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, talking about the other man, but his heart is not with thee. Look at the context. Go back to 23 verse 1. When thou sittest to eat with a ruler, we're all kings and priests, right? you got a husband and a wife, they're all kings and priests within the marriage family. And you sit to eat with them. Consider diligently what is before thee. What are you eating? You can only not only eat with your mouth, but you also eat with your eyes and with your ears, right? You eat that, and your brain absorbs it, right? It becomes nutrients for your brain. And put out what? A knife. A knife. Like a sharp sword to where? So. Your throat. Why? If thou be a man, give it appetite. Don't just absorb everything that comes before you. Sometimes people say words and they didn't mean them. And even if they do mean them, don't just sit there and just absorb all that in your brain. Judge it by the word of God, because that's the knife, the sword. Put it to your throat. Don't just swallow anything that comes to you. Guard what's coming from without, and guard what's coming from within. Be not desirous of his dainties, for they are deceitful meat. Labor not to be rich, cease from thine own wisdom. See, there's the internal mind. So, if you've got to guard your thoughts, you're not guarding it by your thinking, because your thinking might be corrupt. You can't be guarding it by their thinking, because their thinking might be corrupt. So, how do I guard my thoughts? Whose thinking do I need? God. I need God's thinking. Right? Mm -hmm. Because God is the one who's right. I'm not the one who's right. Therefore, i got to go to the Word and think, Lord, how do I guard against these thoughts? He'll tell you how to guard right here in the Word. He'll tell you what you can think. Because God is good all the time. Does that make sense? And that's the context of verse 7. It goes on a little bit more. There's a whole other sermon in there. I'm not going to spend the time on it. So, as you think in your heart, so are you. So, we need the mind of Christ, like Philippians chapter 2 says, right? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And the mind that Jesus had was of the Holy Ghost, right? And the Holy Ghost was telling him what the Father was saying to him. So, we need the same Holy Spirit, the same Holy Mind, that was in Christ. And that mind will lead us in the good and the right way how to deal with one another in marriage. Or our relationships with our friends. Or with our family. Alright, take a look at Exodus 20, verse 17. This is one which will help, especially for uh, the male. But in this day and age, also for the female. And a lot of Sodom and Gomorrah going around. Sorry, guys. Can I just make a phone to this? Yeah, it's fine. I mean, that's really the She said, how? That's fine, right? Hi. Yes. 
Yeah. All right. Hopefully this is making sense so far. All right, and everybody online also. All right. Take a look it says, Exodus 20, verse 17. If you know the Ten Commandments, you should know this already. Take a look at Exodus 20, verse 17. You guys there? Exodus. Amen. All right. And it says this. Thou shalt not what? Bear false witness. Covet. No, covet. Oh. Thy neighbor's <laughs> what? Wife. No. House. House. <laughs> Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Wife. Nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything no, that anything is thy neighbor's. In our day and age, the, the ox would be that which is your tools, right? That which you plow with, right? Oh, okay. be your equipment. And then the ass is your vehicle. That's what you get around on. It's how you travel. So it would be your car, you know, your speedboat, whatever. Your airplane, if you happen to have one. Yeah. Your scooter. Yeah, airplane. <laughs> your roller blades, right? <laughs> right? But in some third world countries, they still have donkeys and the things they ride on horses. Put right. that away. But that's what I mean. So, but in our Put context of marriage, you shall not covet what? Your wife. The wife. But also it said house first. And that house means anything that's within that. Uh-uh. Right? So covetousness comes from the devil. That's what started in heaven. He was covetousness of another position. He coveted the position of Christ. Right? He's like, I need something more. So... If you're not finding it within your own marriage, you'll think, well, I'll find it somewhere else. I'll find it in that person. I'll find it in this relationship, right? And this is where boyfriends and girlfriends these days, even though you really shouldn't have that, that's where they go wrong. Like, I can't find it in this person, therefore I'll go have this fling and I'll have this relationship over here on the side, just in case. And some people hold multiple relationships just in case. And they can't even hold together to one relationship, let alone that many. What would you make you think that you can have that many relationships and be just fine? You can't. And if you need examples of that in the Bible, all you got to do is go to Abraham or go to uh, uh, Jacob and look at all the problems they had. You need one person you're focusing on. And God before all. So, and now if you take it to the higher level, if God's not satisfying to you, you're going to end up just like the devil. You're going to seek that relationship in something or someone else. And that will also break up a marriage a lot because we forget God a lot. All right, no coveting, right? And a lot of people get the old saying, the grass is always greener on the other side. That, that's what they always say. Because you go you, you go and experience that grass over there. You're like, mm, it tastes okay, but that looks green over there. I better go over there. And by the time you get there, you taste it, you're like, nah, it looks green over there. And you just keep moving along. There's an example in the Bible that's just like this. You guys remember the woman at the well? Yes. Turn to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. Even even David himself. You know David had more than one wife? David had numerous wives. Two many wives. And Solomon, he learned from his father. And so he ended up having a thousand wives. That was busy. All right, you guys there in John chapter 4? Yeah. Look at verse 16. Amen. John chapter 4, verse 16. It says, Jesus saith unto her, the woman at the well, Go, call thy what? Husband. Thy husband, and come to him. means come back. It says, the woman answered and said, I have what? No husband. I have no husband. So then why would Jesus, who already knew, ask her to call your husband? Well, he's trying to point out the problem that this woman has. Jesus said to her, Thou hast well said, but you've answered correctly. I have no husband. Because he already knew. For thou, you, hast had how many? Five. Five husbands, and he whom thou now hast, which makes number six, six is not thy husband. In that thou sayest truly. So this woman kept trying to find the true relationship that she needed in the wrong people. She could have been happy with the first guy if she had gone to God. If God would have said that and blessed them, it would have just been fine. Because she wasn't really focusing on God. She's looking at herself. She kept going from guy to guy to guy to guy. Or relationship to relationship to relationship. Or if we reverse it. A lot of youth are like that these days unsettled in relationships and because they learn it from their parents normally they're totally broken relationships because the family home was broken because the marriage was broken even though some people live together 
in the same house. And yet, they're going to constantly argue and fight the whole time. Like my own parents uh, would constantly berate and argue and fight until I couldn't take it anymore. It just broke down. But they didn't get a divorce. They're still, you know, outwardly married. But their mind and heart wasn't together or one on most things. Even down to the little thing. All right. So we have the example of the same woman. Now take a look at Proverbs 4, verse 23. This is kind of similar to the other one. Proverbs 4, 23. Let me know when you guys get there. Amen. Okay. It says this. Keep thy what? Heart. Where's your heart? Right here, it's your mind. Keep here, your mind, your spirit. With all what? Diligence. Diligence. Means, remember like the other one? Guard your thoughts, right? Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are what? The issues. The issues, issues of, life. of life. The issue is that which spills forth like a river from a, a dam, right? Or from a spring. It's, it spills forward. So out of the thoughts comes all everything what you say, everything what you do, right? Are the issues that which breaks forth a life. So that's why we got to keep our heart with all diligence. diligence. Now, you can't keep my heart. And technically, you can't even keep your own heart. Because you need someone else. Who is it? Jesus. You need Jesus. That is by the Holy Ghost, right? To help you keep watch. Because without Jesus, what do we do? We fall asleep. Fall asleep. What happened to the disciples when he asked them to come and pray with him? They fell asleep. They fell asleep, right? They're like, and I have to admit, I fall asleep sometimes in my relationship with him too. You know, I don't mean to. It's just I spend all my energy as a as a baby in Christ, you know, and I'm I'm spent. I'm done. It's all I got. Right? But if I had prayed more, I could still be awake. I'll even give you a little bit of example. Like back in the day before I was a Christian, uh, our family would go to the drive in movies. Drive ins. Who even has those anymore, right? But but as a little child, I'm like six or seven, we're like, we hear a movie and we're like, I'm gonna stay up. Because, you know, drive ins are late at night, ten o'clock, you know, up till midnight. And we're like, we're going to stay up, we're going to stay up. I would stay up to go watch a movie, but in a relationship with Christ, or in a relationship with the marriages, what do we do? We sleep. We fall asleep. We get lazy. We get complacent. We get we uh, make, taking for granted. Yeah, we make excuses. The other person. We make excuses, right? Exactly, is what we do in those relationships. Yet, we could do that for a silly movie, or some other thing that we're excited about, like going to a park, or whatever, you know, a party. And yet, we can't do it in our relationship with God or in our marriage. Why? Where is the priority? Our priorities are messed up. Yeah. And you have to take notice of that. You have to ask yourself, where in my relationship do I do that, if you do it at all? I'm not accusing anybody of anything. But this just happens to be some of those things that we do, taking things for granted and not recognizing we need, this, we need not merely the same excitement as we have those things. We need the more excitement for the relationship between us and our Father in Heaven and with the marriages, and with one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. I mean, when we go and see each other on Sabbath or throughout the week, are we excited? Or like, oh man, i got to see that person again? Or do we take them for granted? Like, okay, there they are. Okay, you know, they're there. Like today, I was trying to teach the little children about those who are being baptized. We should be excited. There's a new baby born into the church. And that's why the family is represented there together to welcome that new person as a child in Christ to receive them into the family. And to take care of them. Because baptism is not the end. Just like marriage, getting yeah. married is not the end. It's the what? Beginning. It's the very beginning of that relationship. And do you know, turn with me to Revelation 12. I want to show you something about that. I'll tie these two, two ideas together. Revelation 12. Revelation 12. Look at right You did not know how much marriage is in prophecy. Revelation 12. Revelation 12 again. Now, I'm going to read verse 1. And then we're going to read verse 2, but don't jump ahead. I want you to see it. Revelation 12, verse 1. Amen. You guys there? Yes. Amen. I got one, amen, I got the head. Okay. Amen. It says, verse 1, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven. heaven. A what? Woman. A woman clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she being with child, child cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be what? Delivered. To be delivered. 
another word for to be delivered is also saved, right? Right? Yeah. Not really delivered. talking about just physical childbirth, but the spiritual aspect to be delivered is to be saved, right? From sin. Look at verse 3. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great what? Dragon. Red dragon. dragon. We read this before. Skip down. There's a great red dragon. His tail drew the third part of the stars. Now notice, verse 4, and did cast him to the earth, and the dragon did what? Stood before, before the, woman. the woman. Before means in front of or across from. He's in front of the woman. What did the woman have in her? The baby. A, a child. child, right? She's trying to give birth. There's pregnancy, right? Which was ready to be delivered for why? Why was the devil there? For to devour, to devour, devour the what? Child. Child. Her child as soon as it was born. born. So those who are baptized or those who are in marriage, like brand new, it's like a new baby, right? This is a new person. They're no longer two. They're a new person together. So it's just like baptism. They're a new person. It's you and Christ together. So just as the devil was about to destroy Jesus Christ when he was born into the world, how much more is the devil ready to devour the marriage and to devour this newly baptized person? You see, the devil is not afraid of holy water. The devil is standing right at the baptism to, to delve into that person's mind and heart right then and there to ruin that baptism that very day and give them evil thoughts and jealousies and covetousness. And he does the same thing for marriage. You think the devil is not standing right next to the two people that are saying, I do? Of course he's right there. He has to destroy that marriage because that marriage is what is reflecting the image of God in the world. Right. It is the relationship of the Father and the Son united together. We are one family. We have the same mind and the same heart. So the devil is not afraid of marriage. He's standing right there to try and break it up as soon as they said, I do. Same with the baptism. That's why we got to warn people who are getting baptized or married, like, beware of the devil. He's going to come and try to destroy your home. He's going to come and destroy the relationship that you just got baptized for. So I'm linking the two together. You guys see that? It's very serious. You realize most people that get married or most people that get baptized have never received that warning. They didn't know. They're, they're going into it totally ignorant. They did not know that there was an enemy right there with them trying to destroy them immediately. And so five weeks from there, five months from there, five years from now, they get to the point where they're ready to get divorced already, and they had no idea all along the way how they were led to that point. They can't think back that far. But they should have thought back to the very moment they were born into the world or in marriage, united, when they said, I do. And that was like, I don't think so. You say, well, why would God allow that? Well, on the other side is the Holy Ghost. And he's there too, saying, I'm going to protect these two if they will let me. Right? This is a matter of free will. Hopefully that made sense. All right. Take a look at Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. See, we can spend a lot on every point of this about guarding your thoughts and about what's really going on in the, in the home. Philippians 4, verse 8. Get there? Yeah. In fact, you know what? Go back to verse 3. Jump back to verse 3. I want to read the context because there's some good stuff here. Paul, Paul is writing to the Philippians, right? He says, I entreat thee also, true what? True. Yoke no. fellow. Okay, yoke fellow is a word which deals with when you hook up, like, let's say, two work animals, like two cows, or two donkeys, or, you know, two horses. You yoke them together. They're united together in a bond. And how are they supposed to pull the wagon? Together. Separately? Different directions? Together. 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 In the same direction. Same direction. Yeah, is one supposed to be pulling stronger, or are they supposed to be pulling with the same amount of weight? Same, same amount. amount. Right. Now, you might be able to compensate here, and then one gets weaker, and the other one gets stronger, right? But you compensate. There's a little bit of shift there. And there's usually, a, what do they call it, like a lead horse or a lead animal that might lead out just a little bit more than the other, or at least get them started. So, in marriage, you got to realize you have a yoke what? you got a yoke fellow. You have a yoke fellow, one that's supposed to be helping you carry... The load, shoulder the burden, go in the right direction, not pull in the opposite direction too much, you know? 
You know, sometimes you get a little close, you gotta separate just a little bit. You get a little elbow room, I need a little room to breathe, right? But, but you're not trying to pull away so far as to where that yoke breaks. And then you lose all whole cargo, which is your whole family. Because those two are pulling something in a direction toward a goal. You don't usually just see people hooking up two cows or two horses or two donkeys just to lead them nowhere. They're going through a direction. They're, they're accomplishing a purpose, right? That's what the marriage is for. It's not just saying, hey, we're not going anywhere. The, the those who are united in marriage, we're going to heaven. Oh, sorry. I had to fix my mm-hmm. little up right there. One sec. Is it dead? No, it's dead. No. Okay. Gotta leave the TV. Hello. All right, it's thinking about it. Okay. All right. We're back up. All right. Don't lose that. You have a yoke fellow. And the one that should be leading both is Christ. Both of those who are in marriage should be following the, the, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. Because he's the one that's leading them to heaven. The goal of your family is not really just have a family. The goal of your family is to have more children for the kingdom of God. And that you might know them eternally. Not just for the short, brief life span down here, 20 years, 40 years, if you're married, happens to have so many years of blessing. All right, keep reading right here. So that's the yoke fellow. And then jump down to the, the, the almost the last part of verse 3. Talking about Clement, and with other my fellow what? Laborers. See, that's, it's still in verse 3, but it's near the end. It says, my fellow laborers. So your yoke, yoke fellow is also a fellow what? Laborer. A laborer. And what does labor mean? Work. 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 So work together. But also in the context of marriage is to give birth, right? There's a labor of work, and then we call giving birth labor. In the home and in the family, you're trying to give birth to more Christians, not just babies. You're trying to increase the family of God through teaching them the good in the right way. Well, if the two aren't working together, then how can we teach them the good in the right way? That's not a true yoke fellow. That's not a true fellow laborer. You're actually working counter to God's kingdom. You might be bringing more children to the world, but they're all going to be lost if we're not working together so that they might be saved in the relationship. All right, keep reading a little bit more. Um, I lost my, my thing. What was my... Four verse? What was it, Philippians? Yeah, Philippians 4. Sorry, my uh, page got turned because of the wind. Philippians 4, 8. Yeah, the wind blew me off. Okay, here we go. It says, verse 4, rejoice in the Lord, what? Always. Always means all the way. And again, I say what? Rejoice. 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 Let your moderation be known unto how many? Rejoice. All. All men. Now notice how that happens. The Lord is at hand hand or near. In your marriage, can they tell that the Lord is near? Or is he far away? Like he's appearing, right? Yes. Where is the Lord? Is he near you? Can they tell that the marriage is like, man, that, that marriage is blessed of God. They just treat one another with absolute mercy and respect and all that good stuff. The Lord is at hand. Or is he at a distance? You can tell. Some days it's closer than others, right? Verse 6, be careful for everything. For nothing. For nothing, which means Wait. be anxious, right? I told you, man, it's always the... Okay? God, God bless you. So it says, be careful. It means full of care. So don't be full of care. Be full of care for nothing. You're, you shouldn't be anxious. We should be in Christ who gives us the peace which passes all understanding. Sometimes it's the anxiousness that will ruin a marriage. And usually it will lead to something like nagging. And it can be nagging one another. It's not just necessarily the wife to the husband. It's the husband to the wife. Both. Or the children to the parents. Or the parent to the children. Right? We're anxious about something, and so it causes us to, to poke at one another a little more. So it says, don't do that. But in everything, by what? Six, verse six? Prayer. Prayer. By prayer, prayer is talking to God, and supplication, that's asking God, with? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God. Say, Lord, I need help with my whatever. First, start with self. Lord, I need help with myself. Yes. Right? Right? Because if you're praying, Lord, help me with this person, (laughs) generally you're not recognizing that you are also at fault somehow. Right? 
somewhere along the way we were unchristlike and it wasn't solved right. So, and then it says, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, and you won't understand it, you're like, how did I get that? Shall keep, no, no, shall keep your hearts, hearts and minds. Didn't we read passages about how you keep your thoughts and guard your thoughts? Now, did it just tell you how to do that? Yes. Through prayer and supplication, and the peace of God, so the peace of God needs to be there. And it keeps your hearts and minds through who? Jesus Christ. Christ Jesus. Christ is the anointed one. Who was Christ anointed of? The baptism of the Jordan. Who came down in the midst? The Holy Spirit. Holy Ghost. When it says Christ Jesus, you're also referencing who? The Holy, the Holy Ghost. That's the Christ. That's the anointed part. The Father is also in his name, Jesus. Jehovah is our salvation. So you need all three persons. So it says, finally, brethren. And you got to recognize that the one you're married to is brethren. The Bible, I believe it is in the, in the, the book of Song of Solomon. It says, my sister, my spouse. You have to have be a sister in the Lord first before you're even supposed to marry them. Right. you got to have a relationship with God before you ever marry them. So you got to recognize this person is my sister and then my spouse. Or my brother and then my spouse. I'm talking about the opposite. Same thing. There's a closer relationship that should be there. The relationship that that person was bought and paid for by the Lord Jesus Christ. And if I injure them, I'm injuring his property. Right? So, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are, here we go, true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, that's goodness, and if there be any praise, think, that's your mind, on these things. These things. What do you see in the other person that you're married to? Do you see Christ? Or all do you see is false? I'm not saying you can't help someone out, out of a fault, right? I'm not saying you can't say, hey, there's a crack here. We need to have that adjusted, right? But is all you see false? No. Right? You gotta ask yourself, then why did you marry them in the first place? It couldn't possibly have started that way unless it was for some sort of monetary reason or something that you know, was not real marriage, right? It should have been based on love, rather than convenience, or for economics, or, or whatever, right? Or for one's own pleasure, right? There's a bunch of reasons. It should have been based on love. So that means, how should you view that other person always? With the same eyes, with love, with mercy, with compassion, with edification, building up. We like to tear one another down, and we rarely tear down ourselves first. You gotta let God build up. Don't let the devil tear down. Because he tore down heaven. God has to restore it. The wrong kind of thinking will what? Destroy your marriage. By the way, for those that don't know, we're looking at Amazing Fact Study Guide number five, and we're on point four. So it says the wrong kind of thinking will destroy your marriage. The wrong kind of thinking will destroy a lot more than that. But the marriage is part of the society, it's the basis of society. The devil will trap you with thoughts like these. Our marriage was a mistake. A mistake. If you had truly prayed beforehand and got godly counsel, then how could it possibly have been a mistake? Right? But the devil will lead you down those ways until you come to the point where, yeah, it was a mistake. What you're really saying then is that God made the mistake. Remember, what God had joined together, let no man put asunder. And if you're saying, God joined us, right? And you're saying, it was a mistake, who really made the mistake then? God. That's what we're saying when we say that. And God doesn't make mistakes, period. He's perfect in all that he does. It's we that make the mistake. She doesn't understand me. you got to ask yourself, why does she understand you? I can't hear you. You're muted. Are you talking to me? Okay, just making sure. Making sure. Okay, good. All right. So it says she doesn't understand me. Why? What happened to the communication? Did you cut her ears off like Peter did to the, the servant of the high priest? Was there too harsh of a word, too harsh of a sword that you used? You might even have used the scriptures against her, right? And sometimes we, I'll show her and just lop off an ear. That's why she can't understand you because you cut off the ear. She's no longer listening to you. 
too cruel. What did Jesus do to that man? Peter, put up your sword, because it wasn't Christ's sword. Put up your sword in its place. He picked back up the ear, put it back off, and healed the man. Right? You've got to be careful about how we attack one another, because we've got ears. And we might even use scriptures. I'm, I'm kind of this way with people online sometimes. They give me a hard time. I go, okay, ah! <laughs> Cut the ear off. They stop listening to me. Lord, heal them. <laughs> I, I went too far. I was too close. A little too excited. But we do that in the marriage. Or it might come to the poke out an eye. I'll show you. And we tell them, you know, and you just throw gravel at them. Right out of the mouth. Because it says your mouth can be open like an open pit of gravel, right? That's where you bury your body. So you just, bah, 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 and all this gravel comes flying out. You're like, can't take it anymore. So they're not going to look at you anymore. That's why they go, you go out here. You get a cold shoulder. And then, I can't take much more of this. Well, there's a certain point which humanity can't take. But it is God who can give you how much strength? Infinite strength. Because it's His strength. That's what happens when we say, I can't take much more. We're relying upon, not God. We're relying upon my strength. I can't take this anymore. But through Christ, through prayer, He can strengthen us to be go through the fire, to be enduring in it, right? That's how you can endure it. Question, or uh, the statement goes, we can always divorce if necessary. That leaves an open door. That means, what was your, your vow really saying? That's like, a, it's like, I do, asterisk. Right? That's like, I do, fine print. Right? Uh. You want fine print in your marriage? Uh. <laughs> Helen, Get some rest. Get some rest. You can watch it later. Right. So you, you don't want the little asterisk. You don't want the fine print. You don't want the fine print there. Don't worry. Don't worry. You can always divorce if necessary. That should never be the option that's on the table. The Bible only gives one reason for divorce, and it's fornication. And even then, you can have forgiveness. It's not a necessity. If you say, we leave the door open to divorce... That means any excuse, any avenue, anything that's wrong can then jump right to that asterisk, can jump right to the fine print, right? I'll have my get out of jail free card. If you look at marriage that way, you're always wanting out. It should be a relationship where we're in this together. together. Till death do us part, right? Mm -hmm. so, it says, I'll go home to mother. I don't know anybody who says that today. Um, but basically, I'll go, I'll go back to my family, right? I'll go back to the people who really love me. Look, that's the same excuse as the other. You can't rely upon others. You have to rely upon God. I need to go to God, not my mother, my father, my best friend, whatever. That's like backsliding, isn't it? It's no longer in the fullness of the relationship. I need to go back to my previous relationship. I need to go back to my preschool relationship of the panel. I need to start over. I'm not saying if you've been through a divorce or you've been through a legal divorce, that's that thing, that you, you can't go back to your family. You should. Um, I'll talk about those that just leave this as an avenue of excuse, and they're just divorcing for any old reason. Mm -hmm. right. right? Just to balance that out. So I don't want to be uh, hard on those who've been through a real strong separation, and they've been through tears and pain and blood, right? No. Be around those who are going to support you. Be around those who are going to help you and build you back up, because you need that. And if you need to go home to the mother at that point, in a real divorce, then yes. Go back home, get some hugs, get some love. Yes? I have a lot of questions for just Okay, all right. Maybe we can, you can, we can talk if you got a lot after Okay? Alright, just write them down so you don't forget. Alright. He smiled at that woman. That breeds jealousy. You start thinking like that. Did you not trust the person when you married them to begin with? Did you not test that out already? That they can't smile at somebody and think, oh, and he's thinking sexual thoughts or thinking, you know, they're, they're, he's going to plan how to get to a hotel room somewhere or for vice versa for the girl. If you can't give that person space, you don't really trust them. And lack of trust will instantly destroy a marriage. It's nearly instantly. 
Because you're always having to monitor them. You're always checking a phone. You're always checking an email. You're checking up on them. Where are you going? How's it going? You know? Give them a break. Don't you trust them to go to the store without you having to know exactly where they went? And then on the opposite side of that, don't you trust the other person to at least give them warning where they're going? Right? Just to trust them a little bit. Hey, I'm going to the store. I'll be back in five minutes. Hey, that's cool. You know, whatever. Trust them a little bit about those things. Work with them. That one will also destroy. Talking about the looks. You hug somebody that it was their best friend in high school. Well, they should be careful, right? But just because someone is hugging somebody they hadn't seen in a long time doesn't necessarily mean like they're thinking that you know yeah, right. they want to be with somebody else. Mm-hmm. Now, whether it's a guy or girl, you should be careful. You should avoid the appearance of evil, right? Because that can lead to a wrong thinking. And you want to try to avoid that as much as possible. It doesn't mean you can't have a friend. It doesn't mean you can't have any of that stuff. And say hi. Stop thinking thoughts like these or your marriage is gone because your thoughts and senses, right, your ears, your eyes, hold on just one second, let me go to the way here. The thoughts and senses govern your what? Your thoughts. Your actions. Or your actions. Your actions, right? This will govern everything that you do. So if you have a wrong thought, lead you to a wrong, can lead you to a wrong action. Avoid seeing, saying, reading, or hearing anything that, or associating with anyone who suggests impurity or unfaithfulness. You know, you might have those friends that talk like dirty, lewd jokes. You surely shouldn't hang around there. Like in high school, man, before I was Christian, we used to talk about the dirtiest, filthiest stuff you ever heard, right? Everything under the sun was, was discussed. And that was like the age of 12, man. It's bad in, in secular school. It's terrible. You don't want to hang around that in your marriages. Separate yourself from that conversation. If you can still say hi to them, fine, but don't hang around them in that conversation or that, that conduct. Or if you know somebody who's constantly with different people in their relationships, right? Don't go on a date with them. They're gonna, that's going to lead you down the wrong path, and their, their, their conversation will lead you down the wrong way. You want to unite with people that are in a solid, healthy marriage relationship, possibly with children, and their family is good to go. That's a healthy relationship. Go out to dinner with them, right? Have pure thoughts. Talk about the Bible. Talk about Jesus in your relationship. Talk about family things that matter, that are eternal. Talk about the foolishness. Like, I know some people in my family that love soap operas. What a waste of time. I could never understand. And yet, you know what? I watched soap operas in a different sense. It wasn't like, you know, the days of our lives that I liked. It was all the anime. And they got just as much drama in there as they ever had in, in soap operas. It's, it's just as bad. All the manga, it's, it's bad. Uh, it could be the Asian soap operas or the, the Filipino type stuff. It doesn't matter. They got just as much foolishness in there. Guys, do not be distracted by the chicken. So the devil will distract you by the chicken. Dog is eating. So, you want to be around people that are inspiring you with purity and holiness and moving in the right direction. It doesn't mean they don't have little flaws, right? You want to be around those people. Therefore, thoughts uncontrolled. If I can scroll up here one sec. I forgot this is a Mac, so I gotta go the opposite way. Here we go. Thoughts uncontrolled are like an automobile in neutral on a hill. You guys know what neutral is? Yeah. It's not technically in gear. It's just the wheels are loose. And what happens if you're on a hill? You're going to roll uphill? Downhill. You're going to roll downhill every time. So anything can happen, and the result is always disaster. Can imagine if that car just starts rolling downhill, generally the street isn't empty, and there's people down below, the cars park. That car could go any which way and green, bang, right into somebody else. And then your marriage can also destroy another marriage, real quick. Because you know that some people, they get divorced, or they're, they're, they're already thinking about separation. Sometimes they try to enter into another relationship with somebody else who's already married. Because they want that back. They don't want to have to start fresh with some new person who's never been married. So they try and leech off of another person's marriage, and then destroy that marriage. So you've got to be careful of that. Yeah. Alright, we're going to move past this point. We're going to look at number five. See how much time we spent on just on that one point? Number five, it says, never, what's that word? Never. Never, never. retire. It means get ready for bed, for the night, angry with each other. And the only way you can do that is through prayer and talking it out. Now, I know that some people get tired. Be careful, Elijah, okay? 
some people get tired. So you got to gauge where their mind is at because tired people don't always think correctly, right? They're fast. They want to get it over with. Okay, I'm sorry, whatever, and sort of it. But they're still technically angry. They weren't really engaging you in the conversation. So how do you do it? One prayer. Make sure that you're not angry. You're not bitter. You're not holding resentment. You're not holding unforgiveness. Start with yourself first. And then if you've got to wait for the other person in the morning, wait for the other person in the morning or at a good time to talk to them. But at least you yourself don't go to bed angry. Now, if you can both go to bed together not angry, that's even better. Let's start with yourself. So it says, verse Ephesians 4.26. So take a look at Ephesians 4.26 with me. Ephesians 4.26. Be careful, Esther, with that camera. Move it or touch it. Ephesians 4.26. Ephesians 4.26. Ephesians 4.26. Ephesians 4.26. I'm also going to read verse 27. So, right, here we go. Amen. Ephesians 4.26. Be ye what? Angry. Angry. You can be angry. It doesn't say you can't be angry. Even Jesus was angry when the people were in the temple. Remember that? They were buying, they are selling. Because so Jesus looked around about them on anger, with anger, right? So... Be angry and what? Sin not. Sin not. There's a point where you can be angry and not sinning. There's a righteous anger. Like somebody really crossed the line. You can be angry. There's a, there's a point for that. Just be careful. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, wrath or your anger. Heaven's but notice favorite. the next verse. Neither give what? Place. Give place to the devil. So it says you can be angry, but don't go so far where you let the devil in and then he starts controlling that anger to where it's no longer the righteous anger, but it's the unrighteous, unforgiving, I'm, I'm never going right, to speak to you again anger. That's the foolishness. Don't give place to the devil. Look at James 5.16. James chapter 5, verse 16. Let me know when you get there. Amen. Amen. You guys there? 516? 516. Confess. Confess your faults. Faults. It doesn't say sins. There are some translations which translate that sins. That's wrong. It's not sins. It's not hamartia. It's parakala. But anyway, so confess your faults. One to another, especially in the marriage. You say, wife or husband, I'm sorry, I use harsh language. You gotta be humble. You gotta bow down. You got to lower self. Sometimes we're angry, even if we're right, we, we, we're self righteous. We're like, I'm gonna hold on to this. Make sure that you don't have that little that little beam in your own eye before you try and take out the splinter in there. Right? Make sure you're right first. So it says confess your faults one another and what? Be healed. And pray, pray one for another. So even if you're, you know, your best friend, your marriage partner, your husband, your wife, right, mm -hmm. does something absolutely mean to you, even on purpose, like right? they're vindictive, you get a spiteful. What does it say? Pray. Pray for them. Didn't Jesus say, "Pray for your enemies, do good to them, to curse you," right? Bless them, all that stuff. You. So. You gotta reflect Christ when you have all this gravel coming at you. You got fiery darts coming at you. Show them the gospel by turning the other cheek. Show them the gospel. That's the hard part. When Christ is getting nailed to the cross, he didn't say, All right, I'm gonna hurl a thunderbolt at you. Forgive them, Father. Father, forgive him. They don't know what they're doing. And it's hard because the relationship is one of the closest relationships on earth. The marriage. I mean, I can understand if it was a friend you see once a week, you know, it's a little easier to kind of go, hey, you know, but the marriage is like, I'm with this person nearly 24-7, right? Unless you have to work and you're separated by eight hours or whatever. And even then it's hard because you haven't seen them in eight hours, and you're like, you dump all the stuff on them in the next five minutes, <laughs> right? I haven't seen you eight hours. Here, let me tell you eight hours worth of stuff. Take it slow. Take it slow. So confess your faults one another. Let each other know when you're wrong. It shows the humility. Don't be late in doing that. Do it almost immediately. The, the moment the Holy Spirit convicts you, confess that fault. Especially for your friends. Confess your fault, man. Hey, man, I was wrong. You know what? I said this thing, and I was wrong. And tell them specifically. Don't just say, hey, man, I'm sorry. You know, like, sorry for what? Be specific. Just like when you confess your sins to God, it's not just general. Hey, Lord, forgive me for my sins. No. 
Lord, I did this today. You explicitly say what this is. Forgive me of this. And you tell him what it is. To cleanse you of that. This generic, like, hey, it's all good, hey, I'm sorry kind of stuff, that doesn't cut it. Like, I know if you bump into something, you say, hey, I'm sorry, I mean, I didn't mean to. But if it's something you did specifically, like you said a hard word, I'm sorry, I said this. It helps remove the poison out of the heart. Hmm. Like they've been holding on. It's like, he didn't really say he was sorry for that thing he said, or she said. <laughs> ah, nah, nah. Right? Right? Hmm. Right? And you become bitter and angry. Because even though they said sorry, you're still holding on to that one piece. They, they, I know they didn't confess that. They didn't tell me the thing. <laughs> right? Yeah. Say the thing. Get it out of there. Pull it out of there as soon as possible. Right? All right. Next one. Look at Philippians 3.13. Look at Philippians 3.13. Philippians. So we're going to Philippians through our Bible and look at Philippians 3.13. Hi. Have you hugged your mom today? Okay, good. You know, moms get sad if they don't get hugs every day. They just, they just get sad. It's just a thing. I think I need a hug. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Get inside. So, Philippians three thirteen. It says, "Brethren, remember your brethren, right?" My sister, my spouse. I count not myself to have what? Apprehended. Apprehended, meaning apprehended Christ. I didn't come to the fullness of perfection yet. I'm not a perfect Christian yet, right? We're, it's, we're getting there, but we're not there yet. But this one thing I do. Notice, it's I do. You have to do this. For getting those things which are behind. behind. So if you forgave them and they confessed it, don't ever bring it up again. It's behind you. Because if you bring it up again, you're circling the block. You're not moving forward. You're just circling the block again and again, and you keep looking at the same fault every time. And that fault will magnify and magnify and magnify until that's all that's in you. Huh? What if you bring it up and it's been Be very careful with that. Be very careful with that because what I mean by that is. She asks, like, what if you use it as an example? Like, something happened in the past. And that's really bad. You should never... You can, but I'm saying, be careful. Because it seems like you're still holding on to that as a memory. Right? Yeah. So, you got to judge. you, you got to be very careful with doing that. Because otherwise you're thinking, oh, they're just bringing up all my old dirt again. Be very, very careful. It generally means, once you've forgiven them, it's in the past move on. Yeah. Like, especially when you've forgiven. I'm you know, when you've forgiven the yeah, past. Yeah, go. Oh. Go. 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 I am. I am. Like, if something happens in the past, and you guys have forgiven each other. Like I said, and then even if it's just, you know, it's just, just talking about it, you're not holding them guilty the for anything. That, that means... They kind of, always have the same mind that you do about it. You know, like, that like, didn't breathe in their mind. They're, they're still thinking about it. About it. I thought you got over that 10 years ago. You know what I mean? That's how they can think. You may not mean it that way, but they can take it that way. Right? That's what I said. You've got to be careful in that. So even if you're saying, I'm going to bring this up as an example, try and preface it a little bit. Like, soften that blow as much as possible if you're going to do that. And I, I really don't recommend you doing that too much. I mean, think about how many times that Jesus has kept bringing back our examples. Right. Like, you remember in 5 when you did this? You're like, yeah, but I thought I could forget you all that. Yeah, but I'm just bringing it up as an example. What would Jesus do? So just be careful, wrong? right? Our mind would be like, oh, God, why? I thought you didn't keep track of our, you know. Right? So, we'll talk more on that again. God, given and forgotten. So, like, like, for instance, in heaven, good example, in heaven, given and forgotten. when God forgets all of our sins and it's no longer in the book of record, he he's not ever going to bring that up, yeah. even as an example, ever again. Right. Now, we're not in heaven yet, so um, that's why I give you the little bit of a leeway, right? There's a little bit of, <laughs> if you need to, but like I'm telling you, soften that blow as much as possible. Manny! Uh, we did that one, forgetting those things are behind. Uh, is there more to that text? Did I miss any more? Uh, 15, did I miss any more? What? Yeah. But not doing something else for another. Right. 
Mm-hmm. Like, when he keeps flipping my page, so I keep I'm looking away. I'm going to be something that's evil. evil. All right. Forgetting those things that are behind. <laughs> and notice, this is and. Uh, notice, please. and reaching for. That's forward. Under those things which are before. And that which is before you should be Christ, because he's the one leading you both. So you forget the things which are past, the wrong, and you look to the one who is right, which is, which is Jesus. And try to get their eyes focused on Christ, and your eyes focused on Christ. And if you're both focused on the same person, you're both heading in the same direction. You may not be seeing eye to eye yet, but once you look at him, then you're both going in the same direction. Eventually you'll see what you need to see. You'll get to Christ. It might take a week of mm. prayer. Right? It might take something along those lines. All right. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Oh, okay. Put that on verse 32. You would think this one would be like, you know, common sense, but really, we got to be told this. Because we don't, we don't think like this. We, we expect others to be, we take for granted others. But look what it says here in verse uh, 32. Be ye kind. Kind. One or another. You think we need a commandment? Yes. 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 We need a reminder. Paul says, be ye kind. One or another. So even if you got to tell something straight to them, be, be kind, kind how you do it. Be kind. Right? Think about how would I respond if somebody told me straight out this? How would I take it? Right? And you got to think, like, since you know the person that you're married to, you know them better than other people. So you got to, like, okay, how would they take this? How should I say this? Be kind one to another, tender hearted. What does that mean? Tender, soft. I have a rock hard heart like a granite, and I'm going to tell them and beat them with my heart. I'm going to tell them everything straight. That's my that's my heart. You're gonna you're gonna crush them. Remember the stone that crushes the idol. The stone will crush that person totally to dust. Right? No. Say again. To be soft hearted. Sit down. Yeah, gentle is a, is a good word. Tender, tender, soft, Tenny. right? Tender hearted. Sit down. For those that love the meat tender, they beat it with a hammer first. So <laughs> make it soft. Right. Make yourself soft, right? Explain it to yourself first in your own mind how you're going to explain it. Like, Would I really receive it that way? No, I better change how that's going to go, right? It doesn't mean you have to, you know, be silly flowerly with it, but, you know, be, be kind, be gentle. So notice, tender hearted, forgiving one another. One another. Don't go talk to them unless you've already forgiven them in your heart first. Why are you talking to them if you haven't forgiven them already? You're just going to be bringing up stuff. Like, you're expecting them to respond, and then I'll forgive them. No. Forgiveness comes first. God already forgave in Christ Jesus before he even sent him. So before you go and send the word to them, have forgiven them first. That's the hard part. We usually say, I'm going to tell them a piece of my mind, and then I'll expect to be you know, forgiven. No, no. Forgiveness comes before. It's the preamble to what you're going to say. One another, notice, notice, what's the next two words after forgiving one another? Two words, what are they? Even as. Even as. Look, is this even? Is this even? No. Is this even? No. Yes. Look, this is even. Like a teeter totter, right? It's got to be like this. So, how did Christ forgive? How did God the Father forgive? That's how we are to forgive. Even, just as He forgave us. So, did God the Father wait around until we paid the debt we owed Him? Nope. So, we don't go to the person and say, I'll wait until they pay the, I'll wait until they say, I'm sorry. In fact, we heard this in our uh, Sabbath school this morning about. Forgiveness comes first. You're not waiting for them to respond to you. Right. You don't even wait for them to come to you. You go to them. You go to them. Like Matthew chapter 18, the type of stuff. Even Christ, if they're on the wrong side, you know. You especially don't have to especially wait, if they're on the especially wrong. Especially that. You don't have to wait for them to come to now, you. Now, if you're in the wrong, you should technically be the one going first. Right. Right? Like when I first became a Christian, it was really hard after I injured my mom uh, by saying something harsh to her. The Holy Ghost like came upon me in massive conviction, and I had to go and really hard because it was hard for me and my mother to get to get along and talk. I had to go and say I'm sorry and specifically say I'm sorry for the sin that I did. But after I felt absolutely relieved um, that she accepted and that God accepted uh, what I had done in my forgiveness. Right? 
confessing that sin, the thing I did. So, go in the spirit of Christ. You're trying to win them back to the marriage. You're trying to win them back to whatever. Or if you were wrong, you're trying to win them back to you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right? Right? Alright. To remain angry and upset means, upset means to be turned over, right? You're upside down if you're upset. Over hurts, grievances, big or little, by the way, they can be true or they can be false, right? They can be true grievances. I'm not saying you can't have a grievance. Exceedingly dangerous. Unless quickly solved, even little problems, what do they do? Become sick and remain. They snowball. You guys know what a snowball is? Yep. Yeah. Snowball American Samoa, you may not know what a snowball is, right? It's totally hot Solid. here. Snowball. I'm from California. There's snow all over the place. Snowball. Rolling down, it gets what? Bigger. Bigger. bigger and bigger. Bigger. The further or the greater amount of time you leave it, the bigger it becomes, it it's it, it's not logarithmic. It's exponential. Right? It's not a straight line. It doesn't become, you know, this and then this and this. No, it's like, boom, boom, boom. It's exponential by the amount of time. If five minutes goes by, a little bit. Ten minutes, you just double. 20 minutes, it is now quadrupled, and 16, and 32, and so on. It increases. So, unless quickly solved, even little problems become set in your mind as convictions and attitudes, how you deal with that person, adversely affecting your whole philosophy of life. I would say your whole marriage, the whole society in your household, right? Your whole outcome. This is why God says to let anger cool before retiring at night. In fact, it's even more than just cool. It's let it be healed. You got a cool Let it be healed. Remember, if you go to Jesus, is he willing to heal you? Amen. Yeah. Really? It's because we desire to go to bed angry that we don't let him heal us. I'm not getting healed. I'm going to uh, uh, My sheets. And my sheets. Mm. <laughs> show you, right? I paid for these sheets. I'll show them. I picked these out, right? I mean, it's simple little things, you know, that, that we do. And if you really look back, and they're silly. They're, they're foolishness. We didn't show them. We didn't show anybody. Alright. See, he says, be big enough. What it means is, have a heart enlarged by Christ. To forgive and to say like with sincerity, I yeah, am I like sorry. It. Notice, for the thing that I did or said, right? Or allowed to happen. Or didn't allow to happen. After all, I don't like this quote that says, no one is perfect. That's not true. Who is perfect? God. God. Is God is perfect. If you have God in you, can you be perfect? Yes. yes. We can so be I don't perfect. I don't buy into that whole no one's perfect stuff. That is, that the gives the excuse. I don't believe in excuses. That we can sin. I don't believe the excuses. So I don't I disagree with that. But that you are both on the same team, it's even more than that. Because remember, you are no longer just two, you are one. one. So while in a sense it is a team, you're really if you have put abuse that other person through language or actions or that stuff. You're really abusing yourself, right? As if the male, who is the head of the relationship, starts punching his body. Does the head feel that? Yeah. What if the body started punching the head? Does the head feel it? Does the body feel it? Yes. So, the marriage relationship is like that, but also among our brothers and sisters here. Because we're all members of one another. If I go step on a toe on purpose and really hard, the head feels it. The whole leg feels it up through the nerve system, right? The whole body feels that you're being angry and fierce to that person. If you got up in the middle of church and just railed on somebody really hard, did, did you just affect you and that other person, or is the other people affected? All the people. Yeah. It's silly to do that, and yet we do it. So it says be sportsmanlike enough to honestly admit a mistake. Yes. you got to be honest. That's the hard part. But the heart is deceitfully wicked, above all things, who can know it, right? We want to hide it, couch it in words, and we don't really want to say, I'm sorry. We want to say this whole speech before we get to the point. Get to the point. Be straight with them. Besides, making up, it says, making up is a very what? Pleasant experience. I'm not going to go too deep because there's children here. Uh, Nathan, Nathan says, be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Very Nathan good. My brother has just quoted a text, be therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. So I don't believe in this whole no one is perfect stuff. No, that's God is perfect and we can be perfect. God is perfect. He made us to be perfect. Doesn't mean robots. 
It means perfect in love because God is love. 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 Therefore, He expects you to be perfect in we love. 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 Right. All right. See how that works. All right. So it says, making up is very pleasant experience, and I'm not getting into the marriage relationship too far because of the children. With an unusual powers to draw marriage partners, what? Closer together. In the kindnesses, let that be restored. See the other person as Christ sees them. Tell them you love them. Show them how much you love them. Touch them throughout the day. Give them kisses, hugs, you know, a high. They're at work, you know, call them when it's, you know, convenient. Not inconvenient, because, you know, in the middle of a business meeting, <laughs> it might be a little tough. But, you know, but if you are in a business meeting, don't rail on the husband or the wife. Yeah, I'm in a business meeting, right? What you do is go, I love you, my wife, but I'm in a business meeting. I gotta go. I love you still. And be honest, even in front of other people. Show them how much you love your wife or your husband. I'm not afraid. Why would you be afraid of love? The world doesn't know love enough as it is. Why be afraid of expressing it? Wake up! Oh, there we go. Good. Alright, thanks for the, the heads up. Good. It says, you're going to draw the marriage partners closer to there, and it says, God doesn't really suggest it. He what? Okay. He, he, works. Works. he expects love. Right? Yeah. And love Maybe. works. Right? Is that enough, or do you guys need more for today? More. You got a little bit more? Yeah. Yep. Okay, All the way on to six. <laughs> what? <laughs> All right, we'll go a little bit more. We'll do one more point. We'll do point six, and we'll take a pause. Okay, you got better things to do. We'll take a pause. Well, I don't want to overwhelm people too much at once. I want you to be able to think about what we've been talking about today. So a little bit of time, and then we'll get into the study. Don't worry. I want to finish the study. This is one of the most important studies. It's key to prophecy. It's key to the free angels' messages for our Seventh Adventist friends out here. Right? The marriage will reflect the glory of God more than anything else. Amen. And I'm not saying that that individual people that aren't married can't do that. God has a place for them too, right? I'm single at the moment, so hopefully God will eat me. Number six, keep Christ where? Center. In the center of your home. Not in the outer porticos, not outside the front door, not in your yard, right? It's like a dog. I keep Jesus in my yard. No, don't keep Jesus in your yard. He belongs in the centermost place of the home. All right, let's take a look at that. Psalms 127, verse 1. Huh? Psalms 127, verse 1. I almost turned right to it. Amen. Hey, hey. Just like me, too. This is key. You guys there? Psalms 100. Amen. 127. I want to make sure everybody's there because it, it's perfect when we get there. Okay. X. Verse 1. Okay. There, you there, you there, you there? Yes. Are you guys there? Amen. 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 There. Okay. It says, except. 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 The Lord build the what? House. The house. And the house is built on the marriage. Except the Lord build the house, they what? Labor. Labor in vain. vain. What is vain? Uh, no use. No use. Useless. Pointless. Useless. Pointless. No goal. All of them. That build it, except it the Lord keep the city. The watchman, what? Waketh. Wakes, but in vain. If the Lord is not the center of the family, the center of the home, the center of the marriage, your husband and wife, uh, parents and children, all the work you do throughout that whole day, no matter what it was, to try and sustain that family together, it was pointless. It's going to fall apart. It probably fell apart three or four, 19 times that day already between That's small spats and arguments, uh, covetousness. Because somewhere along the way, Jesus Christ wasn't at the center. Whether it was the two little siblings, Jesus Christ wasn't at the center. Whether it was the parents and children, Jesus Christ wasn't at the center, or the marriage itself. And those little fractures would show throughout the day. And that goes for just your standard relationships, whether it's at school or your sports team. Imagine if your sports team was arguing with them. How could you have a, a cohesive unit and work together? Somebody hits a ball out in the field, you're like, I'm going to get it. It's like, no, I'm going to get it. You both bang. Call it. Yeah. Well, he said, no, I'm calling it. I don't want it to be. But you said, well, I called it first. Should you press your advantage every time? Not necessarily. Sometimes you got to go, you know what? Even though I called it first, I'm going to let you call it because I'm, I'm your friend. And I want our team to succeed. And you may have to fail that the team succeeds. You know what I mean? So that works the same way with marriage. The same way. You might have to, even though you're right, you called it first, you might have to back down 
and let the other person let their plan go forward. And maybe it succeeds, and maybe it doesn't. But that way you're together in it. You don't want to be two separate minds. Be together in it as much as possible. So, but the Lord is the one that builds that house. What's the foundation of the house? What does the Bible say? Jesus. Let no man lay into the foundation other than what? Christ Jesus, right? He's the foundation. The foundation of the marriage, the foundation of everything. Another text you can think of, what's the first text in the entire Bible? Genesis, Genesis 1. 1. The beginning. What does Genesis 1 verse 1 say? Created. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So the first two words, in the beginning, the next word? God. God. You need to think about that in your marriage and in your family. In the beginning, whatever you're going to do, whatever that relationship is about to do, whether you're going to go on a hike, you're going to go to church, we're going to wake up. In the beginning, God. God. And it will be God who will create the perfect scenario. Yeah. So remember, when God created, it was good, it was good, it was good, it was very good, it was finished, perfected. So in the beginning, God. Without the beginning, without that foundation, without God being the beginner of it, how can he be the finisher? How can he be the author? How can he be, right? The omega of it. He can't be unless you allow him to be the alpha, unless you allow him to be the first, unless you allow him to be the author. He can't be the finisher unless he's the author. If he's not the author, who is writing your story? Uh, the devil. The yeah. devil has a script. What? He's got a script ready to go. You don't believe me? You just ask Hollywood. The devil has a script. It's the same script over and over again. Total destruction, division, ruination, Fornication. selfishness, fornication. The devil has a script. And he's got your name on it, starring you. You, adultery. Right? Whatever it is. Then you have to be adultery, but it can be adultery. Right? Some people are in marriage and their whole goal is money. They're not really there. Right? They're so busy about money, 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 how I can earn my millions of dollars. They're still in a marriage. They haven't slept with any other else. But their goal is nothing but money. The other person is neglected. Their real treasure. Because gold and silver will pass away. But the person, if they're saved, that's an eternal treasure right there. So they don't really understand what the real treasure is if that's what they're doing in marriage about money. I don't know who needed that, but apparently the Holy Ghost led me to say that. Alright, so Proverbs 3, verse 6. Take a look at it. Psalms, Proverbs. Amen. Proverbs 3, verse 6, it says, You guys there? Amen. In how much? All. All thy ways acknowledge. Right? Who? Him. him. God. Who is the him in context? God. The Lord. The Lord. Verse 5, right? And he, notice he, what's he going to do? Shall Shout. direct. He's going to direct. So is the Lord path. a director? Does he have a script? Yes. The Lord has a script Indeed. for you. And guess what? It's starring Jesus, and then you get to be the, the secondary actor. Yeah. Mm. You're the cool star. I'm sorry that you guys are not the main star of your own story. Jesus is the main star of your story. Man. You're the sidekick. I'm and the background scene. If you don't want to be the sidekick, I'm sorry. You need to go to the devil because the devil has the, has the script where you're the lead. Yeah. You see, in the story that God is writing, God is the one in charge. God is the one who's leading. God is the primary actor. Okay. Right? It's the prime mover. The prime Amen. We are in response to him. We're the sidekick. Mm -hmm. Right? We're the comic relief, as it were. Hey, we are the secondary interest. We are all that. Hey, to be second is a great place. In case you didn't know. In God. Yeah. Right? Right. Because even in God's eyes, we're first in his eyes. Mm -hmm. Right? Because he places us first. first. So while he is first, he places us first. See how that works? Yes. So second place, that's a great place to be in a relationship with Jesus. I don't need the devil's script. Mm -hmm. i got a great place. Mm -hmm. So how is it in the man? He's going to direct your paths. He let God direct your story. Where are you going in the marriage? Where are you going in life? How many children should you have? Right? What should I name my child? You know, people name their children any old thing that comes to their mind these days. Some of the names mean nothing. It's just letters put together. They found it. Like in the Bible, every name meant something. Like Daniel, judgment of God, right? Samuel, right? Isaiah, Jeremiah. When you name your child, you should, what's the goal? What was the purpose? What do I want this child to be in Christ? Is the real name. Like these guys have some beautiful names here. Like Emmanuel, Esther, Elisha, and Ellen, right? Great names. 
even my parents, who were uh, who are Roman Catholic, they me, Aaron. They wanted me to be a priest of the household, right? That's why you chose the me, right? I'm not gonna tell you my middle name because it have anything to do with mine. Uh-huh. I... All right, all right. Take a look at Philippians four, verse seven. Philippians four, verse seven. Philippians, that's the Philippians. General Electric Power Company, G E D C. Philippians four, verse seven. And we've already read it partially earlier. It's when we keep Christ at the center of the home, this is what will result. This is the result of following the instructions. You know how we get instructions on like a package of something? Like how to bake a cake? You can say, I need to follow the instructions. If I follow the instructions, I get the result of the cake. If I don't follow the instructions, I get the result of something else. Mess. Doesn't taste good. So, the result of following this instruction of keeping Christ at the center of the home is this. And the peace of God, God, what happens? Which all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Through Christ Christ Jesus. Jesus. Keep the center of the home is Christ. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. All right. It says this is the greatest rule. Really because love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. With all your being, all that you are, love God. And as you love God that way, you'll be able to love the person that is tied to you, that is connected to you, that is a part of your own heart, body of your own body, right? Flesh of your own flesh. Because isn't that the way Adam was with Eve in the beginning? Yep. How did God make Eve? From Adam. He didn't say, poof, here's a woman. Mm. He took of the rib of the man, a sense of the closeness of his being, the closest thing which is in his heart, your center. Right? And made a woman. That relationship should be that close. Mm. Right there. Should be that close. Tender. Mm. Caring. Mm. And you don't punch yourself in the ribs or anything, right? You don't try and break your ribs. Mm. So that is the greatest rule. It really covers all the others. Put Christ, which is love, first. The real secret of true happiness in the home is not what? Diplomacy. You guys know what diplomacy is? Uh, it had diplomacy has nothing to do with love. Being diplomatic. Yeah, diplomatic. But what does it mean to be diplomatic? Uh, strategic. It can be strategic. That's correct. Yeah, true. But is that love? Nope. It's no. Not. It has nothing to do with love. Right? You know, like Solomon, how he tried to unite the kingdoms through marriage. Through marriage. Right? It wasn't really love. It was diplomacy. Diplomacy. Even though Solomon's a type of Christ, how he wanted to conquer the world through peace rather than through war. So in that sense, it's a type. However, diplomacy is not how a marriage should work. That's not if you do this, I'll do this for you. Right? If you have a contract because I had a vow, I have to do it. Right? No, it's because I love. That's why I said I do. I love you because that's why I want to do this thing or do this other thing for you. Right? Not diplomacy. Not strategy. It's not trying to outmaneuver one another. Like, okay, if I do this thing, if I take her to this movie, she'll do this for me. Yep. Right? Because I'm a guy, I'm talking to the girl. Or you can say, you know, the girl and the guy. Right? That's strategy. That's not a chess match. You're not trying to overcome the other person through skill of mind. Right? You're trying to win the heart and affection by love. By self-sacrifice. If you don't know the marriage, walk through the sanctuary. What's the first thing you come to in the sanctuary? Sacrifice. Sacrifice. Mm-hmm. Right? The next thing, dead to self. The back to the self. Through the veil of the flesh, right? Being a light unto them. Sharing with them the word of God, right? All that stuff. Praying for them. That's the sanctuary of our marriage. And then, God's love. Oh, boy, your butt stinks. Who's on your heart? Who's on your heart? Are you praying for them? Yes. All right. An entire effort to overcome a problem. The only thing that you can overcome a problem with is... Christ. This is the rather use of Christ. Hearts filled with Christ's love or God's love can never be very what? Apart. Far apart. Because in heaven, it's one family. We're together. It doesn't matter whether you're on this world over here or this world over here. They are united as a family in heaven. Right? They're together in this. With Christ in the home, in the marriage, it will be what? Successful. You want a successful marriage? Because success means you had a goal in mind. Right? People that start a business that have no goal, they can never be what? 
successful. They're never going to be successful. They don't know where they're going. If you don't know where you're going, how will you know what to do? So you've got to ask, where are we going in this marriage? And if your goal isn't heaven, what is the goal? Living an earthly life. Right? Where is that goal? What? How can you be successful? And if you're successful, you know the real businesses that are successful? What do they got to do? Sacrifice. Sacrifice. You gotta sacrifice your time. You gotta sacrifice your money. You gotta put into it a lot, right? You gotta make sure you are vigilant. Otherwise, things slip through the cracks, right? Somebody might steal your money. Somebody might embezzle. Somebody might take a hold of your wife or your husband without even knowing it. Be diligent. Be faithful, right? Be. What happens if you don't maintain a business? Like you let the, the roof go unrepaired for ten years. You get leaks. You don't fix the plumbing. What happens? Leaks. It's leaks. You don't fix the electricity. What happens? Power goes out, right? You don't pay the electric bill. What happened? So you got to maintain all that in the marriage. Show them kindnesses throughout the day. Do those little things, even if you're tired. Say, Lord, give me the strength. I need the strength. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. And the human flesh, as the Bible says, is strong. No, weak. It is weak. You know, at the end of the day, you're just like, I don't want to deal with anybody's problems, let alone my problems. Let it go away. Spirit is willing. Be gone from me, right? No, ask for the strength. The Lord will give you the strength. He will lift you up. The gospel, the good news, is the, what's that word? Uh, what's that little four-letter word? Starts with a C. Cure. It's a what? Cure. cure. It's a cure. That's a very dirty word these days. Oh, yes. The government said, you can't say cure. You can't say this herb cures this. You can't say the cure for cancer unless we provide it. No. The gospel is the cure for every disease, physical, spiritual, and mental. Guaranteed. It is the cure. I don't care what anybody says. Come arrest me. I'm going to preach it in prison. The gospel is the cure for all marriages that are filled with hatred, bitterness, and disappointment. It is the cure. But you have to let the cure work. You have to let that cure be applied to each person. If only one person has the cure and the other person doesn't, that other person is dying of disease. Your camera just got turned off, sister, just to let you know. So, there's two people there. You gotta have the, both people have the cure applied where? Here. The heart. If you think about the Old Testament, the lamb was the cure, right? Where where was the lamb applied in Exodus? Uh, for the clothing. The door doorpost. Post. Remember the blood applied to the doorpost? Yes. Where did the door lead into? The home. Good, right? This is the central. You gotta apply the blood. By the way, that mark is actually the symbol of the top. It's a, it looks like a cross in Old Testament Hebrew. The top over the doorpost, it looks literally like a cross in Old Testament um, pictographic Hebrew. But in modern Hebrew, it looks like it looks like a doorpost. But in Old Testament, it's a cross. Let that gospel sink in. Let it be painted over the blood right here. That way, whatever comes in has to cross the blood. Don't let sin and selfishness go out. Don't let it come in. It prevents all this bitterness. Thousands of divorces. The gospel prevents thousands of divorces by miraculously restoring love and happiness. And people are looking for great miracles today. They're looking to be restored in health, and they can be. But marriages can be restored just as well, even if adultery took place, even if it took place numerous times. Did you know that even Hosea was commanded to marry an adulterous woman? And in the end, that marriage was fixed because it was represented between God and his own people. Because if you're really saying that marriages can't be fixed, you're saying that the gospel can't affect your salvation either. I want you to really think about that. If you say God can't fix a marriage, then what can he do for you and your salvation? It can't be fixed. Because that relationship was broken. If you can't fix it, then all of this is a waste of time. But the gospel can fix it. It's a guarantee. He will save your marriage too, notice the key words, if you personally are willing. Lay your will on the side of God's will. Say, Lord, I don't know how you're going to fix it. Lord, this marriage has been going rough, excuse me, last five years. 
And God can't fix that. He can fix the dead. Can God raise the dead? Yes. Can He raise a dead marriage? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, even if both of you are dead. You're two zombies, right? Married together. You're both dead. He can raise you through the Word, through life, through prayer, by His Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. Right? Now pouring in the love. He can fix it. He can make it right. And He can forgive. And He can also make you forgiving. Remember, he's making you like him. And forgiveness is where a lot of that starts. Yeah. All right. I'm going to end that there for today. I think that's a lot. I think um, the Holy Ghost has given us quite a bit to think about today, whether you're married or whether you're not. Because a lot of these rules apply just to, not just to marriages. They apply to your day-to-day relationships, whether it's to your parents, uh, to your brothers and sisters, in the family or in the church. It applies to your teammates. It applies to your schoolmates. It applies to the business world and wherever you go. Amen. The same relationship things can take place. So may the Holy Spirit bless you. Uh, keep in mind all the things that he wants you to remember. And we're going to pray and close in prayer. Let's kneel if you're able to kneel. If not, that's fine. You don't have to. I'm not going to kneel. And we're going to pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much, God, for leading by your Holy Spirit today for leading our minds and our hearts closer to you so we might understand how our marriages and our families and our children can be held together by you. I pray especially and ask for anyone who is struggling in marriage with their partner, their husband, their wife, their children, or their just relationships in general. God, they would fall upon their knees, pour out their heart upon them, and that you would answer their prayer according to thy will. That they may be blessed, that their marriages may be saved that the families may be saved, that the children may be saved, that the relationships to one another in the church and in society may be saved, God. We know, God, that with you nothing is impossible. With you all things are possible, and that you can do. You have almighty power. You have a thousand ways of which we know nothing to correct and bring us to the truth. Thank you, Father, for giving us of our sin. And help us, Lord God, to be forgiving in our own heart. That we may not be unforgiving, unkind, or cruel to those who are married, who are family. Father, fix our speech. Heal our ears that we may hear you. Open our eyes, Lord, that we may behold you by faith. That our hearts may be open to receive you in all things. I pray for everyone that's listening, that has been studying with us. God, your Holy Spirit pour upon them, and may be filled with joy and with belief and with faith, God. To believe you, they can fix the marriages, they can fix the problems, they can be healed, they can be whole again. There may be one, and may you, God, will glorify your name on the earth as you did in your son Christ Jesus. Glorify them, God. You may be glorified. I pray and ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. We'll see you all oh, next um, time uh, in our next study, whatever that will be. And then for my sister Aldora, I know you got questions. I'm gonna have to talk to you another time. I hope you got it written down. And um, you want to stay on the phone, or you want to stay with us? Um, can I read something from Brother Nathan? Yes. Maybe I'll read, read something from my brother Nathan. One sec. One sec. Um, he says. Hi to those back in California. Um, why why does it keep going back and forth? Okay, there. All right. Um, he said, "The grace, oh man, this this thing keeps the grace of Christ, and this alone can make this." This institution, what God designed, it should be an agent for the blessing and uplifting of humanity. Um, and thus, the families of earth in their unity, in their unity and peace and love, may represent the family of heaven. Now, as in Christ's day, the condition of society presents, presents, Hold on. Yeah, the scroll is like so. Yeah, a sad comment upon heaven's ideal of this sacred relation. Yet, even for those who have found bitterness and disappointment where they had. where they had. Where they had hoped for companionship and joy, the gospel of Christ offers a solace, the patience, patience and gentleness which His Spirit, 
His spirit. Brother Nathan, that is a long quote. Is that a spirit of prophecy? Uh, we'll have to read it next time. We'll try yeah. to post it with it because it keeps scrolling back. Yeah. All, All right. right. So basically, the gospel itself, right, is what heals the marriages. Yeah. 